When he first recovered the gold plates in September 1827, Joseph Smith began puzzling over the characters he saw written on them. He apparently couldn't make sense of them himself. His mother Lucy recalled that not long after receiving the plates, Joseph began to make arrangements to accomplish the translation of the record. Accordingly, Joseph began copying characters from the plates shortly after, retrieving them to find someone other than himself who was able and willing to translate them. These efforts led to the now famous incident between Martin Harris and Charles Anthon as recounted in Joseph Smith's history. But there's more to the story than what is recounted in Joseph Smith's history canonized today in the Pearl of Great Price. Historical sources identify Luther Bradish as the first scholar contacted by Harris before visiting Charles Anthon. There is a very understandable reason why Harris would have wanted to show Bradish some of the reformed Egyptian characters from the Book of Mormon plates. Bradish had traveled extensively in Egypt and the Middle East between the years 1819 through the years 1825. During his travels, as one historian observed, British came to know several key archaeologists who were then excavating and removing all kinds of Egyptian treasures and artifacts and had become familiar with Egyptian hieroglyphics. The details of Harris's visit with British are unfortunately not known. After visiting with British, Harris then met with the scholar Samuel L. Mitchell, a well-respected scholar of his day. Mitchell had taken an interest in studying Native American tribes in New York State. It is likely that Harris consulted with Mitchell precisely because Joseph Smith had been led to uncover an ancient record giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they spring. According to one contemporary source, during Harris's consultation, Mitchell compared the characters with the hieroglyphics discovered by Champollion in Egypt and set them down as the language of a people formerly in existence in the East but now no more. Mitchell in turn recommended that Harris visit Charles Anthon, a professor of classics at Columbia College in New York City. Exactly what Anthon said after his examination of the characters brought to him by Harris is difficult to know, since Harris and Anthon left contradictory accounts of the incident. Harris remembered Anthon pronouncing the characters genuine, but then quickly dismissing the affair by protesting, I cannot read a sealed book, when informed that the source of the characters were revealed by an angel and therefore unavailable for scholarly examination. Anthon, on the other hand, repeatedly denied ever endorsing the authenticity of the characters and claimed to have warned Harris that he was being taken in by a con job. A plausible scenario that could account for this conflicting testimony is that Anthon initially believed the characters could be authentic and expressed interest in them, but quickly backed away after the Book of Mormon was printed and his name became associated with a national religious scandal. Two things, however, are clear from Harris's visit with these scholars. First, he walked away with absolute confidence that Joseph Smith was telling the truth, that he had in his possession an ancient record, and second, Anthon's comment that he could not read a sealed book was seen as a fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 29 verses 11 through 14 by Martin Harris, Joseph Smith, and early members of the Restored Church of Jesus Christ. Although the reactions of these learned men varied, Martin Harris was satisfied enough with their replies to further assist with the translation and publication of the Book of Mormon. He went on to serve as a scribe, financier, and witness of the Book of Mormon, all at a great personal sacrifice.